for the discussion and we have already set up uh, the chairs on the first row where the panelists will sit and interact uh, with the audience to make it a little bit more of an interactive and positive uh, atmosphere for discussion. Uh, we have originally we had reserved 90 minutes for this session but then we thought maybe more time will be needed so we can move on. We have three hours at our disposal, but we don't need to fill the three hours. If we run out of steam, we can conclude earlier, as some people have indicated already that they have to be leaving. So we take it, uh, improvise a little bit. But please leave free the very first row as we intend to move down there. Uh, before asking our session chair to introduce uh, the meeting, I make a few preliminary remarks and I would also uh, like to ask the Secretariat to uh, put up the uh, policy questions. Uh, we have had a process when the mandate of the IGF was renewed to look at IGF improvements. There was a special working group set up and the working group made recommendations and one of the recommendations was that each session should address some policy questions that would help shape the discussion. And we were also asked to reach out to the community, and we did so. We asked for public input, and we got the input, and these policy questions we received are available on the IGF website, and they will be made available on the screen. But uh, for better comprehension, I will read them out, and our moderators will bear them in mind. Okay. On Internet surveillance, the first question was the need to prevent mass surveillance carried out in the guise of targeted surveillance. The second question was balancing cyber security and privacy. The third question, principles of open Internet slash net neutrality. Fourth question, one of the emerging issues is on Internet regulation. Regulation versus self-regulation where the Internet is concerned. How can countries that have questions on Internet regulation versus self-regulation be aided to work on a level playing field that assist the current best industry practices being adopted, best practices that make the Internet and thus countries and institutions safer from harm? Fifth question, better channels of cooperation between stakeholders especially in areas such as cyber security. Six, agreement on fundamental minimum principles for Internet governance and multi-stakeholder cooperation. Seven, priorities for the IGF, the Internet community and multi-stakeholder governance post-2015. And with that, I hand over to our session chair, Dr. Santianto Santosa. Please, Chairman, you have the floor. Thank you, Marcus. Good morning, everybody. I hope you enjoy the dinner last night. You can also look at the Balinese dancers, the modern Balinese Faganza, and also the original Balinese dancers. Ten years ago, I was the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Tourism and Culture. At the time we made survey, especially for the Indonesian tourism, the result was at the time surprised me when a question to the foreign tourists deliver, most of them said that what actually the question is, but actually what is the strength of Indonesian tourism? They said the people. And then, following the second question, which part of the people that make you attractive? They say, the smile. So at that time, I just realized that Indonesia is a country with the highest smile per capita in the world. And you proved already, you know, the last uh, six days, and you can find the Indonesian people with the smile. So, with this introduction, 
I don't take much time. And the issue also very attractive is, as Marcus just mentioned, regarding the emerging issue. So I would like to deliver the floor to our moderator. So, please, madam. And please maybe introduce yourself, Anne Rachel. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Anne Rachel Ine, and uh, I'm the uh, Chief Operations Officer at the AFRINIC, the Regional Internet Registry for uh, the African Region. Um, so we're happy to be here. Um, I will let Jovan introduce himself later on when he uh, takes the floor. Uh, we're happy to be here with you today to moderate the session on uh, emerging issues. Uh, as panelists, we will have this morning uh, Scott Budsby, the Director of Office of Multilateral and Global Affairs in the Bureau of Democracy, Rights and Labor at the United States uh, uh, State Department. Then we will have um, Ross Lajeunesse. He's the Global Head, Freedom, Free Expression and International Policy. Um, then we're having, let me have your, then we're having Yari, Yari Arko, who is an um, uh, expert on uh, Internet architecture with Ericsson Research and also the chair of the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is IETF. Um, and then we have uh, Johan Hallenberg from the Swedish government. Um, and our last and not least panelist will be Joanna Varon Ferraz. She's a researcher on digital rights and uh, internet governance at the Center for Technology and Society at Fundesao Getulio Varjas. Um, I'll pass on to Jovan now. Oh yeah, we actually will be having commentators and at, um, when we finish the presentations here, we'll come down to the floor so that everybody will be seated and we'll hopefully have a more convivial atmosphere than us sitting here and, uh, you know, talking down to you there. Uh, we will have commenters from the floor. Uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle, uh, who is the Director of Internet and Jurisdiction uh, uh, Process uh, in France. We will have uh, Meji Margiono from Civil Society Indonesia, uh, Nick Ashton Hart from uh, CCIANAT from Switzerland, and uh, Ambassador Fonseca from Brazil. So thank you very much for uh, joining us all, and um, I'll pass on to Jovan now. Thank you. And Rochelle, good morning. My name is Jovan Kurvali. I am director of uh, Diplo Foundation, Swiss Maltese Foundation, working on uh, inclusive and effective uh, diplomacy and global governance. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Raul uh, Echeverria and the group that he led, which proposed this topic to be discussed at the emerging session. And as we know, this topic has already emerged on the various diplomatic agendas worldwide. Therefore, it is uh, quite uh, uh, important issues to, to be addressed during the Internet Governance Forum. It also is a proof of the um, relevance of Internet Governance Forum in tackling the issues which are of high importance for international community uh, in general and internet, internet community in particular. Uh, Marcus already outlined the main questions that were discussed in the preparation for the session, and they will be some sort of architecture uh, of the, our session. We will tackle this question uh, in five main baskets, and we will organize five main baskets uh, in a 20 minutes time slot. The first basket will be on a question of infrastructure and basic functionality of the Internet. And we'll have expertise on each basket, both uh, on the floor and in the room. The second basket will deal with the uh, human rights issues, question of privacy protection, and the other human rights issues related to the Internet surveillance. The third basket will focus on security and uh, situations when the surveillance is justified and uh, under what uh, uh, conditions. Fourth basket would deal with data protection 
and the economic model. And fifth, uh, the last basket will, in a way, wrap up the discussion within the general framework of uh, Internet Governance Forum, which is ethics. We will address the question of trust on the Internet and impact of Internet surveillance on, the, on trust. The underlying uh, issues which will be appearing in our discussion are issues of the law enforcement, procedures, and international law. Therefore, this is a general infrastructure, and we plan to proceed with uh, 20 minutes dedicated to each basket after we hear from our panelists' introductory remarks, which they will also re relate to, to these uh, five main issues. I think with uh, this is, uh, uh, general intro, I would like to invite uh, Scott Bosby to uh, provide uh, his introductory remark on the question of Internet surveillance. Scott, please. Thank you, Jovan. Um, well, I'm very happy to be here, as all of us from the United States government are. We had some drama in our country uh, with our government shutdown, which put in doubt whether or not uh, we would be able to come here. And I'm pleased to say that even had the shutdown continued through this week, we had approval from the White House and other senior officials in our government for us to attend the IGF because we recognize how important this forum is to our own policy as well as the overall policies relating to the Internet. The United States comes to the Internet Go Governance Forum every year to stand by our commitment to an open, interoperable, and secure Internet. We recognize the importance of the issue of surveillance to the international community and are grateful for this opportunity to engage with all of you here today on it. As President Obama has said, the United States welcomes a discussion about privacy and security, and we are right now intensively having that discussion in the United States as well with all of you in the international community. We know that many of you, as well as many people in the world, have questions and concerns stemming from the recent reports about alleged U.S. intelligence practices, and we look forward to engaging with you today on them. When it comes to those practices, I can say that the United States gathers intelligence of the type gathered by all nations. All governments are involved in efforts to protect their countries from real threats and harm, and all governments collect information concerning such threats. As we undertake those practices, we remain committed to protecting the American people as well as our friends in the international community. And those friends include not only governments, but the private sector and civil society. This commitment relies on robust intelligence capabilities to identify threats to our national interests and to our, advance our foreign policy, which includes our commitment to human rights. At the same time, we also acknowledge that such intelligence efforts must be fully informed by our international commitments, our democratic principles, our respect for human rights, and the privacy concerns of people around the world. Consistent with the terms of open debate and the democratic process, President Obama has initiated an effort to review and reform our intelligence practices and ensure that they are appropriate in light of our commitments and our principles. In terms of reform, the President has already ordered the Director of National Intelligence to declassify and make public as much information as possible about certain sensitive intelligence collection programs undertaken under the authority of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, otherwise known as FISA. Numerous documents, including decisions of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, have been released as part of this effort. Furthermore, the President has appointed a group of outside experts to advise him on how, in light of advancements in technology, the United States can employ its technical collection capabilities in a way that optimally protects our national security and advances our foreign policy while taking into account other policy considerations, such as our commitment to privacy and to civil liberties. This group has begun its work and is expected to produce its recommendations by the end of this year. We look forward...
we look forward to those recommendations. Consistent with our normal practice of not commenting on specific allegations of intelligence activities, I cannot say more than this about such allegations. But I can say a few things generally about our commitment to human rights and to an open Internet. First, I would like to emphasize that the United States does not use intelligence collection for the purpose of repressing the citizens of any country for any reason, including their political, religious, or other beliefs. Thus, for instance, we do not use our intelligence capabilities to persecute anyone for ideas that they express online. Let me also assure you that the United States takes privacy seriously, both that of Americans and of individuals around the world. That commitment to privacy is reaffirmed in the President's international strategy for cyberspace, which states that, quote, individuals should be protected from arbitrary or unlawful state interference with their privacy when they use the Internet, close quote. As President Obama has recently said, America is not interested in spying on ordinary people. Our intelligence is focused above all on finding the information that's necessary to protect our people and, in many cases, protect our allies, close quote. Furthermore, the United States will continue to uphold its longstanding commitments to defend and advance human rights in our diplomacy. This includes preserving the consensus reflected in Human Rights Council Resolution 20-8 that the same rights people have online also apply offline. Sorry, that they, the rights that apply offline also apply online. The United States will also stay actively engaged in the Freedom Online Coalition, a group of 21 governments that works with civil society and the private sector in a multi-stakeholder approach to support the ability of individuals to exercise their human rights and fundamental freedoms online. As several people have suggested over the course of this week, this coalition may be a very good forum in which to continue to this, the discussion on balancing the need for security with human rights and to identify an appropriate way ahead on these tough issues. Estonia will be hosting the next ministerial meeting of the coalition on April 28th and 29th in Tallinn. We will also continue to advance Internet freedom through our programs. Since 2008, the United States has committed over $100 million to Internet freedom programs around the world. We intend to maintain that robust level of support for such programs. On Internet governance, the United States remains steadfast in our support for a multi-stakeholder model that supports international trade and commerce, strengthens international security, and fosters free expression and innovation. We strongly believe that proposals to centralize control over the Internet through a top-down intergovernmental approach would slow the pace of innovation and hamper global economic development and could lead to unprecedented control over what people say and do online. Such proposals play into the hands of repressive regimes that wish to legitimize inappropriate state control of content. We also believe that the current multi-stakeholder system should be strengthened and sustained, particularly through broader multi-stakeholder participation from the, the developing world. Through our programs, we have sought to make such participation possible. We are aware that some governments seek to take advantage of the debate initiated by the recent disclosures to draw attention away from their repression of their citizens or the need for democratic reforms in their countries. The acts of these governments include, for example, arresting opponents for what they say or intimidating them into silence and stealing intellectual property for the benefit of their economies. We therefore, therefore want to emphasize how important it is not to let governments that do not share a commitment to human rights and fairness to exploit the current debate to their benefit. We should not allow them to gloss over the very important differences between their Internet monitoring activities and those of countries like the United States that conduct intelligence activities to enable responsible statecraft. We hope that the discussion today will reflect the fact that the issue of surveillance is a global one 
and will take into account the views and practices of everyone around the world. We intend to listen closely so that we can take account of the many comments and recommendations from you and ensure that they are incorporated into our own governmental deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. I'm sure that our discussion will result in quite a few insights and useful suggestions for the process that, uh, as you indicated, started in the United States. And I would say reflections are going on all over the world, as we will uh, hear from the other interventions. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Ross uh, Lajeunesse from uh, Google, and we will hear something uh, more about the business perspective of the... Thanks very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Do we have a remote question? I suggest that we go... Uh, to the yeah. Am I all set to go? Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Ross Lajeunesse from Google, and it is uh, a sincere pleasure to be here. There's been, obviously, a lot of discussion and debate about this issue, and that is, of course, a very good thing, and it's very necessary. But in order to have a discussion about this, uh, a discussion based on reality and based on facts, I just want to start by providing a few clarifications so that we're all operating from the same understanding. The first uh, is that Google does not provide direct access for any government to our data, our servers, our infrastructure, and it never has. And you can use any term you like to try and describe that accusation, a back door, a side door, a trap door, anything like it. But the fact of the matter is that we simply don't do it. We also don't accept large blanket-like government requests for user data. We are subject to the law. So when we receive a government request for user data, we look at each and every one of them very carefully. We have a team of lawyers at Google whose sole purpose is to do exactly that. They ensure that the request is valid, is legal, follows due process, and is as limited in scope as possible. And very often, we push back, and we sometimes refuse to comply. And you can see this if you go to our transparency report online, which lists the number of government requests we receive, how many of them we comply with, and we do that uh, around the world wherever we have services. Now, on the issue of transparency, we believe this is a critical element to the debate. We're not newcomers to this issue. We published our first transparency report. We were the first, country, uh, first company in the world to do so about three years ago because we recognized long before the Snowden revelations that this is a critical part of our responsibility to our users. Every six months, we release an updated transparency report, which is better and more granular. And I'm glad to see that now many companies are doing the same. We're continuing this work by working with NGOs around the world to publish national transparency reports. And we've released one in Estonia this year, and we've highlighted another in Hong Kong, and that work will continue. So transparency, of course, isn't a cure-all. But we really believe you can't have a meaningful debate on the path forward. You can't have a debate on this issue if you don't have the facts, which is why we're suing the U.S. government right now to get them to reveal more information about the number of national security requests and demands that they make on companies. And we're also on a separate track supporting key legislation in the United States Congress sponsored by Senator Franken and another bill by Representative Lofgren to do the same thing. Now, I want to emphasize that it would be much easier for us and much easier for any company to simply comply with government requests for user data. But we don't. And we don't do that because we're a company built on the idea that if you put your user first, everything else will follow. We don't do that because we take our responsibility to our users very seriously. And that's both a matter of principle and a matter of good business. We're very aware that if our users don't trust us, 
they won't use our products and they'll go somewhere else. So again, this debate is good and absolutely necessary, but I also want to echo a point made by Scott and made by Mike Harris at the Index on Censorship, which is this. I'm all for holding the United States government and Western countries to the highest of standards. We need to do that. But I don't want us to do that at the expense of not focusing on other countries, countries where their surveillance programs are just as bad or worse, countries where journalists are beaten, bloggers are imprisoned, and activists are killed. The Expression Online Institute just released a very important report on Azerbaijan, where we held last year's IGF, and how horrible things have gotten there over the past year. So I'm all for this discussion about the alleged hypocrisy of the United States and Western governments, but let's not do so in a way that discounts or damages the ability of those governments to continue their otherwise excellent work, which they've long done in supporting Internet and journalist freedom, in supporting human rights around the world, and let's not attack them to the point where it undercuts their very important support for the multi-stakeholder model of Internet governance. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ross. Our next speaker is uh, Yari Arkov from uh, ITF, uh, from Finland, but currently chairing uh, ITF. Yari, please. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, and uh, also, this is my first ITF, and I really enjoyed all the discussions this week, so thank you all for that on, on this topic and, and many other topics. And, and then on to um, this topic. So obviously the Internet community, all of us here, care deeply about how much we trust the commonly used Internet services and protocols that these services are based on. So the reports about large-scale monitoring obviously disturb us. Interception of targeted individuals and intelligence activities have, of course, been well known, but I think many people are concerned about the scale. And if Internet technology itself is vulnerable to wholesale monitoring, that is also a big concern, and we take that very seriously at the IETF as, as, um, as the people uh, at least partially in charge of the technical aspects of, of the Internet. But I wanted to put these events in perspective. Um, maybe you can consider this talk as the do not panic message. These are hard times, but we can also work on the problem, and we should. The first observation that I would make is that surveillance is probably a wider problem in the world than what you would believe just by reading the mo most recent newspaper headlines. If you live in a glass house, be careful of throwing stones. And if it weren't true before, I'm sure there are many intelligence agencies in the world who have a bad case of NSA envy today. Secondly, surveillance is not a new issue. Even we at the ITF have had to deal with some, some issues around that his, historically. In 1994, we articulated the view that encryption is an important tool to protect the privacy of communications. But at the time, big parts of the world considered encryption a dangerous tool and wanted to limit its availability. In 2002, we decided that the ITF standard protocols must include appropriate strong security mechanisms. At the time, various nations wanted to employ weaker security mechanisms. Now we are facing a new situation, and once again, Internet technology needs to evolve to match today's challenges. We need to deprecate the encryption algorithms that are now considered weak, and that is, by the way, something that we do all the time with new information from research community and others. We also need to consider a bigger update to the security of the Internet. On Tuesday, I talked about the by default secure model. Maybe that is something that we can, we can uh, pursue. But technology alone is obviously not a solution. Even if we had a perfect communication security system, you would still need to trust the entity that you're communicating with. If the peer leaks your conversation, perfect security was not helpful. So let me talk a little bit about some of the other areas of work where um, some, some things might be useful. First, network operations and build-out. We've seen some proposals to build more uh, Internet exchange points and add more connectivity. Those are excellent things for many reasons. They will keep traffic more local. They will increase speed, lower costs, and enable local Internet businesses to grow. 
an internet that is more densely connected is a good thing. Second, the open source community. Open source solutions are useful to assure ourselves about the reliability, reliability of our tools, whatever they might be. On, on some areas, it may be that we should actually consider doing more than we have done so far. So let us all support additional efforts in this, this area. And there's more, research community and analysis of security vulnerabilities. The attention on the matter will surely make it possible to have political and legal discussions, maybe the transparency that we just talked about. That's a good thing. Finally, I wanted to say that uh, I really do wish that we keep the ideals of the Internet clear, clear in all of our minds and not compromise on them. We still need a global and open Internet, one where we can all work together across borders. Let us not fragment the Internet, and we still need an Internet that is open to innovation and new applications without asking for anybody's permission to create those innovations. And we still need an Internet that is easy to manage and expand. Thank you. Thank you, Yari, for this brief introduction, which will give us more time for some discussion later on. And our next speaker is uh, Johan uh, Hallenberg from the Swedish government. Johan, please. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Johan. I work with the Department of International Law and Human Rights at the Foreign Ministry in, in Stockholm. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us and me to, to this panel. Um, we're happy to accept. We've been engaging with the IGF for, for uh, many years and uh, we continue to really support this important institution. And the reason why we're engaging is, is partly because we believe that the integration of a human rights perspective in the discussions on Internet and Internet's future is, is crucial. So that is part of the reason why we're engaging so much in the IGF. So the ultimate goal is actually to make sure that the promise on securing human rights online as well as offline is, is realized. We cannot forget that last year we had an affirmation by consensus in the UN in the resolution 28 that Human rights, they do apply in the offline environment, online environment, as well as offline. This was also something that uh, the entire uh, community uh, agreed to. The resolution was put forward by Sweden, the US, Brazil, Tunisia, Turkey, and Nigeria. And it re received support by 87 co-sponsors and then adoption by consensus. We need to remember that this is, this is a great success and we need to make this a reality. Governments uh, have a duty to respect uh, and protect human rights. And this is a central part of our uh, obligations. And security is needed to secure individuals' rights and freedoms and also ultimately it is to protect the open and democratic societies in which we live. But it's important to remember that there is no trade-off between human rights and security. It is not about balancing. It is about securing the respect for human rights, but doing it in a way that is secure. In providing security, the government will address several aspects. One important aspect is certainly to protect rights and freedoms of individuals from abuse of others. But equally important is to secure that the state itself does not violate rights and freedoms. In other words, setting the limits for state power. This is why the rule of law is so critically important. The constitutional framework includes rules on legality, transparency and accountability and provides the fundament for what the state can do, to what extent it can utilize its powers in order to secure the well-being of people. In providing security, access to electronic communication has become an important tool for law enforcement agencies to combat crime and for security agencies to improve security to the public. Swedish legislation makes a distinct separation between surveillance of electronic communication by law enforcement agencies on the one hand and intelligence collection by security agencies on the other. This separation is critical since the operational mandates and objectives for law enforcement 
and security agencies are indeed very different. We are now at the point in time where trust in the Internet is challenged. Therefore, to governments all over the world, it's crucial to strengthen the relationship with civil society and the trust with people. Governments simply cannot afford to lose legitimacy. But to strengthen trust, we must reinforce the principles of rule of law, transparency, and also respect for human rights. This is done through a deeper dialogue with all stakeholders. Therefore, initiatives that come out of the civil society are important and should be taken seriously. The necessary and proportionate principles, they represent such an important initiative and it deserves attention from us. Therefore, in recent months, we have arranged two consultations in Geneva and in New York with the international civil society and other governments on these issues and principles. And as a result, Foreign Minister Carl Bildt at the recent Seoul conference on cyberspace last week presented seven fundamental principles that should apply to maintain respect for human rights when carrying out surveillance of electronic communications. And these uh, seven principles, um, they are about legality, legitimate aim, necessity and adequacy, proportionality, judicial authority, transparency, and public oversight. This is now the foundation where we would like to continue the discussions with, with all. We welcome a continued deeper dialogue with all stakeholders, and we're willing to engage with you. One such example is the work um, in the Freedom Online Coalition, in which we will continue to engage uh, deeply. Um, I conclude here, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for giving me the word. Thank you, Johan. I just realized that we breached the diplomatic protocol by putting Joanna at the end of the table. <laughs> Joanna Varon from the from the Brazil, please go ahead. Hello, thank you for the invitation, thank you all of you for being here, uh, hearing us and discussing. Um, what I want to highlight here is that the emerging details of the U.S. National Security Agency mass surveillance programs have painted a picture of pervasive mass cross-border surveillance of unprecedented reach and scope, and scope that's far wider than any reason that could be related to the enforcement of national security, nothing to do with real threats or harms. This scope of comproved surveillance was as broad as it involved tapping communications of the president of countries like Brazil, which could be considered a friendly nation, and as wide as, as, as it assessed sensitive strategic business, business communications, such as communications from, from Petrobras, our oil company. This scenario is not only unacceptable for leaders of states, but for all human rights defendants. It doesn't matter if this data was used or not, the simple collection of our data and our metadata already rep represents a complete disrespect to the privacy rights from citizens from all over the world and a disrespect of the provisions internationally agreed on international conventions and treaties, and treaties addressing fundamental human rights. And it's also a bit hypocritical as all the surveillance was performed by, performed by countries that used to pose themselves as defenders for an open and free Internet. And I'm not saying that in order to promote any polarization between different countries that could be posed as good or evil, but I'm saying that to highlight the need uh, that every each country shall assume that we still need to work a lot in order to ensure that human rights are protected online and offline. Significant changes are indeed needed. The scenario that we live now is a scenario in which trust among governments and in the major ACT and telecom companies is completely broken. 
But it's time to move, move forward, and I agree with the table here. And we need to think about solutions and engage on how to implement them. As a response to this scenario, I'm happy to see that Brazil has been uh, proactive and has been taking actions in many different levels. As a Brazilian, I'm happy with that. In the national scenario, we have declared urgency to approve our Marco Civil, our civil rights-based framework for the Internet. Uh, inspired by principles suggested through a multi-stakeholder mechanism incorporated by our uh, uh, promoted by our Internet Steering Committee, Marco Civil, uh, as it's written today, became a model in terms of both content and process, as it was developed through a wide inclusive process of online and offline consultations and resulted in a draft that protects privacy, freedom of expression, and other digital rights. I think we could all learn uh, about this pro process to think uh, um, in the international scenario as well. Uh, also in the national scenario, thinking about long-term solutions, Brazil is now in uh, promoting incentives for research, development, and innovation of our ICT sector, and particularly for building a mail service uh, with encryption by design. Uh, but, of course, the Internet is global and is meant to remain global, and we will not address this issue uh, only with national policies. So what I want to highlight here is that uh, uh, the, actions, uh, is the actions taken at the international scenario. So besides uh, um, delivering a very strong statement at the UN General Assembly, which highlighted all the principles from CGIBR and all the principles that are now drafted in Marcus view and which are committed to human rights, uh, our president now has proposed uh, for us to, to engage in a mood stakeholder fashion and to, in, to, to develop a summit a summit that, in my view, should, shall be bounded by the principles addressed by the President in her statement at the UN General Assembly. Um, and this could be an opportunity to address all those issues, and I believe that these issues on surveillance should be addressed in both ways changing the way that companies are operating in order to ensure transparency, but also protection of these users, for instance, by, promote, by promoting encryption by design. But on the other hand, states should review their practices. It's good that the U.S. is willing to reform its intelligence practices, so I take this opportunity to ask the U.S. government to refer and analyze the international principles on the application of human rights to communication surveillance, which has been, have been endorsed to date by over 280 international organizations and represent an attempt to highlight and address some of these concerns. These principles provide a framework in which to assess whether surveillance laws and practices are consistent with human rights standards in the current digital environment. As Johan has relighted, they focus on legality, legitimate aim, necessity, adequacy, proportionality, judicial authority, and due process. They also consider user notification, transparency, and public oversight. I welcome the initiative from the Swedish government to consider these principles and invite all the governments from all over the world to do the same. As I've mentioned, it's time to reassess our practices in order to ensure that they are drawing respect for human rights with a deep dialogue with all the stakeholders that care for the Internet. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you for the panels for your in, uh, initial intervention. And I think the underlying point is that 
we can recognize and all panelists uh, recognize the severity of the problem and the need for some action and solution as soon as possible because uh, it is affecting activities of governments, business sector and uh, all internet users. And there were a few uh, underlying and interesting points that could uh, trigger some discussion and your reflections. Um, as um, uh, Scott mentioned, uh, there is a um, need uh, to uh, observe international law and the existing rules. There is a need to achieve certain balancing, balancing acts between uh, security and human rights. But we had later on slightly different uh, view from Johan that it's possible to have win-win solution and don't, not necessarily to create a balancing act. And that could be an interesting point of discussion between, uh, about balancing act between security and human rights. Ross uh, rightly indicated the need for uh, evidence-based policy making, therefore moving from the general uh, reflections to, the, to evidence based on the, on the concrete issues and transparency. Um, Yari highlighted the importance of, uh, of um, um, not only technological but also policy solutions. Technology is not enough. Um, Johan also indicated the importance of rule, rule of law Institutional separation between uh, electronic communication agency, if I'm correct, and uh, intelligence agencies. Therefore, this is one aspect that we should tackle today. Procedural check and balances as a structural uh, design that could help us to avoid uh, this situation in the future. And Joanna listed uh, an excellent summary on uh, human rights, uh, question of ne uh, necessity, necessary and proportional reaction, and the uh, question of using existing international legal tools. And this is important. We have existing international tools that could be applied to this field, including International Covenant on the Civil and Political Rights. And it was clearly indicated throughout the discussion that it is position of all major players, including the United States, that existing international law, rules should, should be observed. Well, with this quick wrap-up and ideas for discussion, I pass the floor to Anne Rochelle. Thank you very much, Joha. I think we're going to go directly to our uh, commenters from the floor. So um, I am going to give the floor to Ambassador Benedicto Fonseca Filo from Brazil to respond to some of the microphone. Yeah. Do we have microphone somewhere? Do we have a microphone? Oh, oh, well, well, then our oh, microphone is coming. Yes. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'd like to start by doing something that usually we do in intergovernmental setting at the UN, for example. I, I served in, at the UN a few years ago. And uh, we used to initiate our talk by saying we align our statement with the statement that was delivered before by some regional group or some larger setting. So I'd like maybe to innovate <laughs> uh, in the context of IGF and say that uh, I'd like to align my statement with the one that was delivered by Joanna Varon on behalf of civil society because I think she expressed in a very uh, clear way, uh, most of the things I was prepared to say, and so she made my life much easier. So uh, I'd like to, to align uh, my statement to what she has expressed. And also, to, in a large extent as well, to what has been stated by the representative of Sweden, uh, we share also the view that it is not inconsistent to pursue uh, human rights dimension and examine the surveillance uh, uh, context and the, the disclosures in the context of enhancing the human rights dimension of it. It's not inconsistent uh, with the fact that we all uh, and some of us, uh, we are very firmly committed to human rights. We are not diverting the discussion. We are not uh, ignoring that the, this discussion could, be, could serve other purposes which are not our own, but at the same time we do not think it, is, it would be a good thing to, because of this to ignore the situation, try to improve on the situation we have. So uh, the seven principles that were spelled out by 
Minister Kalbilt at the SU conference also, I'd say very much, express the kind of approach you'd like to take in, in that regard. Uh, having said that, and uh, referring to the speech that was delivered by our President at the United Nations at the opening of the general debate of this year's uh, United Nations General Assembly, uh, I'd like to, to highlight that uh, the protection of human rights, privacy, uh, freedom of expression, well, human rights in its those two specific manifestations are at the core of, of the concern of President Dilma. She has clearly indicated that from the Brazilian perspective, from, there is a clear need that, that at the international level we should devise and launch uh, 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 a process that would lead us as an international community to achieve principles and norms that would guide use and operation of Internet, and this should be guided by uh, a vision inspired by the multi-stakeholderism approach uh, and also be firmly grounded on human rights and other principles she spelled out. So we see no inconsistency in pursuing this and not take into account the larger picture that we want to be very careful uh, about. And in that sense, uh, it is very important, as has been highlighted by Joana, that uh, we view the summit we intend to hold in Brazil as a follow-up of the speech that was delivered by President Dilma. And, of course, we came to this setting. Uh, uh, our Minister of Communication came here, and he was mandated by the President to further discuss and collect views, and I would say that without deviating from our main subject, that the summit in Brazil today will also incorporate other dimensions of, of discussion, not only focusing on principles and norms, but this is indeed one of the very clear parameters for us, uh, for, for the meeting, that will enable to, to engage in uh, other aspects of the discussion as a result of the consultations we have held here, but the, the clear focus on the necessity as international community working in a multi-stakeholder environment to uh, develop principles and norms is, is clearly one of the main objectives we have in mind. And uh, if I can just uh, clarify one point that has been object of some misunderstanding in the course of this meeting. Uh, when President Dilma delivered her speech at the UN, she referred to a multilateral framework, civil framework, uh, with the support or full support and full involvement of uh, civil society, private sector, and other stakeholders. And later on, when we came to this meeting, our minister uh, was in contact with her, and, uh, and as a result of the information he provided, she made clear that she meant what she really meant was referring to multi-stakeholder, not only multilateral. And uh, I, I was just reviewing the news from Brazil, and I saw that yesterday President Dilma referred again to this, and again she used the word multilateral. So uh, I know this in the heads of many people will uh, may, maybe lead to a confusing uh, uh, reflection on this situation and say, well, Brazil is a swing state. <laughs> we doesn't know if it wants to be multilateral, multi-stakeholder, or what is the situation. What I would say that even, uh, first of all, President Dilma, she has interpreted what she has said, and she's, uh, we, in a way, there is no contradiction in what she said in all those circumstances. From the point of view of government, uh, and this is a very important thing that has been discussed here in some panels, that we should be very uh, careful about the concepts, the language we use. Sometimes from the point of view of government, when we, the word multilateral is, is used, what is meant primarily is the, that this is used in opposition to unilateral, more than meaning that is something to be done on a purely intergovernmental setting. I think this was the, the meaning that she, she wanted to convey when she delivered the speech at the UN, that we want a framework that would be indeed done by many parties, not only 
reflecting the, the view of one single party or, or a restricted group of parties. And she explained that this certainly does not convey the idea of excluding any stakeholder. So I would uh, just uh, uh, maybe, and I apologize for taking so much time, but to clarify that we need uh, maybe not to pay too much attention to particular uh, statements on a particular setting responding to a journalist that made some question, but having into account the larger picture, and the larger picture the president interpreted as meaning mood stakeholder. And when she mentioned the civil framework as a reference for her speech at the United Nations, and she used the word, as Joanna has spelled out, this was developed in a mood stakeholder setting. The, the principles of developed by the Brazilian Steering Committee in a mood stakeholder uh, way are clearly inspired President Dilma's speech. So when she was referring that we need at the international level such an instrument, clearly there is a linkage to the mood stakeholder dimension, even if there is not the word there. So I just want to caution that sometimes uh, from the part of government at, at that level of leaders, maybe we should not be too much uh, vigilant about uh, any particular word, but see the larger picture and what is the, the real intent. So I, I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to thank uh, all stakeholders we have been meeting uh, in the course of this IGF uh, on the part of government, civil society, private sector. We have seen an overwhelming support for the idea to develop, to go in the direction that was uh, indicated by President, proposed by President Dilma, but also building on contributions that will be fed into the process. And uh, it was very uh, uh, stimulating for us to see that there is a willingness to mobilize different stakeholders uh, to, to come forward with proposal, to involve, to be involved in the preparation for this meeting that we intend to be truly stake, mood stakeholder from its outset. Uh, from the agenda setting, from the, the kind of outcomes, and we see it as a contribution to the processes that are the existing processes. We want it to be respectful of the existing process and not compete or overlap or, or, or supersede any of the existing uh, processes uh, we exist. And maybe a final word, that Brazil is a uh, very firm defendant of human rights. We have been, as was spelled out, uh, at the core group that drafted this landmark Human Rights Commission uh, Council resolution uh, that, that gave this very clear message that human rights offline should be also respected online. We are ready to uphold human rights in many settings and uh, in, a, in settings that would be global, that would be constructive, that would lead to, uh, uh, to stimulate countries and provide for a positive incentives for human rights to be uphold uh, in a worldwide basis. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Fonseca. I'll go directly now to um, Bertrand. Oui. We, we have remote interventions. And then we, no? Yes. There okay. Are, um, Hold on a second, Bertrand. Okay. We're going to start with remote um, uh, questions. Go ahead, Fundi. Um, thank you, Anne. Um, there are two questions from Peter Hellmans, and we have interaction over Twitter as well, so that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, Peter has a question for the U.S. representative, and he wants to know, does defending U.S. foreign policy interests include surveillance of the phones of heads of governments of countries that are friends of the USA? And there is a question for the representative from Google. There have been reports that U.S. cloud business can expect loss of business from non-U.S. customers in the coming three years to the tune of about 30 billion U.S. dollars and that the overall negative impact for the IT industry over the next three years could be up to 180 billion U.S. dollars because of a loss of trust. What do you intend to do to restore that trust so that people feel that they can trust cloud providers to keep their data private and secure? The tweet also relates to the same theme of proportionate and necessary steps that governments can take on the theme of surveillance vis-a-vis -vis security. 
Thanks so much, Siri. So now we'll go to Bertrand while um, our panelists can reflect on what they want to say later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Rachel. So again, I'm Bertrand de la Chapelle. I'm the director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project. And um, following the discussion before, I wanted to highlight that this debate on surveillance is actually can be placed in a larger framework of issues, and I'd like to tackle quickly three. The first word is sovereignty. What we're talking about here, among other things, is the exercise of sovereignty in the digital age. The traditional exercise of sovereignty is on the national territory. And the advent of the Internet is introducing an incredible new capacity for national decisions, for better or worse, to have a transboundary impact on other, on citizens of other countries. The fact that operators are based in one country allows by definition in any country the authorities of that country to exercise sovereignty on those operators and impact decisions that have consequences for actors on another territory. This is a potential extraterritorial extension of sovereignty and it introduces also imbalances among the different countries depending on the number of actors that are located on their soil. But the reverse is true as well, following what has been uh, named uh, as an euphemism, the recent events uh, and the revelation of the Snowden affair. A large number of actors and countries in particular have taken positions in reaction in order to defend their sovereignty and have pushed forward, for instance, the notion of data sovereignty requiring or intending to require the location of the data regarding their citizens on the territory. This is a reintroduction potentially of physical frontiers in a certain way in a technical infrastructure that was intended from the onset as a cross-border architecture, not necessarily a completely borderless, but a cross-border architecture. This is a challenge because the traditional notion of the international system is based on the separation of sovereignties and most international organizations are based on the principle of non-interference in the affairs of some other country. The current situation is challenging this and is putting among, in front of governments an incredible challenge which is how do you cooperate to manage shared online spaces? That's the first point. This is a new type of challenge. The second word that I would like to highlight, and I, this goes to, to what Joanna was mentioning, it's the notion of due process or fair process or any kind of element that ensures that the procedures for issues related to surveillance but also to law enforcement related to freedom of expression, privacy, and so on. Any kind of process that deals with human rights and the rights of citizens and internet users have to be done according to a set of rules that are fair and ensure due process. This is particularly difficult when you deal with transborder relations. When something is done in one country across the internet and you have to obtain data, take down content, have to ask for the uh, removal of a website. There is currently a lack of procedures to handle this and fair process mechanisms to handle the relationship between states, platforms, and users in a fair process manner across borders. And this question is a reflection also of what happens here in this debate on surveillance because what we've been talking about is the implementation fair process oversight. And that's the main issue because principles in themselves are not sufficient to ensure the protection of human rights. They are necessary but not sufficient. If the procedures are not appropriate, if the national frameworks are not sufficiently protective, it is not enough. And even when the, the framework is present, the actual implementation of the framework may be faulty sometimes, and oversight is an important element. 
Finally, the third word that I would like to use is the law on unintended consequences. The trend that we're seeing today in reaction to those recent events and the debate on surveillance is a very troublesome one for everybody. The notion that in reaction and by legitimate concern regarding the protection of their citizens, governments are thinking about establishing rules regarding so-called data sovereignty is something that we should explore with extreme caution. There are extreme technical challenges to do this, and there is a great likelihood that if you want to sort in the databases of large global corporations, which users are from one given country, are located in one given country, you might end up having to do a larger breach of privacy than the protection you want to establish or the, the things you want to correct. And the second element, and this was very present in a meeting that we organized in Delhi in the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, where the industry in India, not the foreign companies, the industry in India, was explicitly saying to the government, be careful what you wish for, because if the principle of data sovereignty is pushed too far, you're harming the potential of the local industry to be an actor, a major actor in the global cloud business. So without elaborating, the challenge is we are in a situation where because there is no sufficient international frameworks for discussion among the different stakeholders on those issues of sovereignty in the digital age and, and due process, we run the risk of having a large number of uncoordinated actions by different governments and different private actors that will look perfectly natural as a first step with, whose cumulative effect will be harmful for everyone. Which leads to my conclusion which is this meeting at the IGF has proved beyond doubt the benefit of addressing those issues in a multi-stakeholder format. The fact that the whole environment has triggered an event that is likely to take place in Brazil is providing an opportunity to address some of those issues and to probably hold a little on some of the national decisions that are under discussions until there is a certainty that the cumulative effect is not harmful. The Brazil meeting will be important. There are other processes. The meeting of the Freedom of Land Coalition has been mentioned. There has been a great effort, and I'm sure somebody in the audience will refer to, on a set of principles called necessary and proportionate that are not enough, but that will certainly be part of the discussion. And I want to highlight a final element regarding the Council of Europe recommendation two years ago that established the principle of no transboundary harm, i.e. the responsibility of states for the decisions at the national level that may have an impact across borders. So those elements are aspects that require a lot of caution in the individual actions that the different governments are contemplating to make sure that they are collectively for the benefit of an open and unified internet. Okay. Thank you, Bertrand. Before we continue with the out, uh, other commentators and the remote participants, I would like to invite Yari, who has to leave in about 10 minutes, to reflect on uh, uh, discussion so far, especially from the point of view of the infrastructure and basic functionality of the Internet. Please, Yari. Thank you. And um, apologies for being forced to, to leave. I had another commitment um, uh, in another room um, um, in, in a moment. Uh, and, um, of course, you know, much of the discussion has been sort of at, at the different level, not so much about the infrastructure, perhaps, or, or the technical things. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of things that I've heard in the discussion so far. Um, I, I really wholeheartedly agree with Ross about fact-based approach to this. This is, this is really crucial. Um, the other thing that is important that was highlighted by, by many, many people, um, or almost everyone, is transparency um, and the rule of law 
um, those are really good things um, and, and worthwhile to work towards. And then I um, kind of wanted to return also to, you know, the uh, important principle question, and, and many of you brought up um, th these points as well, uh, you know, to um, look after uh, human rights, um, multi-stakeholder model, de decentralized nature of the, the Internet. Um, in particular, the multi-stakeholder model is really key for, for us to have an open, you know, well-functioning Internet that, balances the different um, concerns um, and, you know, I was with pleasure noted the, the comments from uh, uh, Ambassador Fonseca Filho, among others, on you know, how important the multi-stakeholder is. And it seems like there's consensus here, at least so far, on multi-stakeholder being the way forward. And um, I think it was Joanna who commented also that, that the Internet needs to stay global. That really is true. Um, the, the, so the only... <laughs> Only thing that I, I gathered from, from all the discussion so far that kind of relates to infrastructure or, or technical things was this um, possible demand for keeping data local. And I just wanted to raise an issue from a technical community perspective that sometimes we may have um, conflicting desires or, or requirements and we need to be careful what we wish for. Um, I think a blanket requirement for data to be local for within a country would probably harm innovation in the internet because I mean if I'm I'm a small enterprise who comes up with a great idea and and I, I you know I, I will invite users from all over the world I, I don't necessarily immediately have an ability to build out um, facilities all over the place um, I need to be able to to innovate without too much burden. So, and, and this is just one example of the kinds of things that we may may run into. But uh, we need to be careful about uh, setting um, too many demands on how the network actually runs. I mean, the, the management and build out needs to be possible still and, and cheap. That that's that's a key, and the innovation needs to continue. So, those were the short remarks that I have at the moment. Thank you, Eric. You gave us quite comprehensive overview of the infrastructure and technical aspects of the Internet and a few warnings that we don't go too far with some uh, prescriptions, but more guiding principles and nudging towards a useful so solution and leave uh, everything else to develop more spontaneously. Well. Thanks, Jovan, and thanks very much, Yari, for joining us so far. Um, I know that Joanna had another commitment. You're still okay? Oops. Great. Fantastic. So um, I'm first going to go to the remote participation people, and then I'll come back to Nick Ashton Hart. Thank you, Anne. Um, there's a question from um, Monica Arnett who is a freelance reporter and a journalist from Germany. And her question is to U.S. and Sweden representatives. She wishes to know, do the more mighty technical tools oblige us to fundamentally reconsider intelligence legislation because we otherwise face a state within the state which blinds public trust, oversight, erodes democratic control and starts to possibly blackmail those elected to govern. Thank you. Thanks, Sudhi. So, up to Nick now. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, the Computer and Communications Industry Association uh, is, is made up of many of uh, of the Internet's more successful business-to-consumer companies. So, of course, we, we have a strong interest in this, though I would say that, that our comments stand on their own and, and, and our members, including Google, who are here, um, have made their own statements and, and uh, you shouldn't conflate the two. Um, I think, fundamentally, we're facing a problem that is not technical or an Internet problem, even though uh, the Internet has, has made, the tools of the Internet has made it possible. And many aspects cannot be solved by legislating, especially at the national level, about the Internet 
such as uh, Jan has so excellently put on, on local hosting. We have a paradigm where we are all common digital citizens, but also common digital foreigners, um, by which I mean that in the analog past, our nationally protected rights of privacy um, were protected because each country could only post, frankly, so many cultural attaches in their foreign embassies before countries would say, no, that's too many spies, you have to get out. Um, so you could only spy in the analog world, frankly, on a fairly limited number of non-nationals. Um, unfortunately, now that situation is inverted, and it is now uh, the, the lack of any legal, any legal prohibition on countries spying on other countries' nationals means that we are all in some way fair game for an almost unlimited amount of surveillance by countries except the one we live in. And so in previous debates about you know, ACTA in Europe, SOPA, PIPA in the United States, um, we saw a strong reaction against using the Internet in a way that was harmful to, to, the, to the Internet itself to solve a specific issue for the benefit of a specific stakeholder or set of stakeholders. And I think in a way we can, we can argue that we have the same dynamic here where technology is being employed by security services to facilitate information gathering with few limits, especially on non-nationals, uh, thanks to technology. Um, yet at the same time, the Internet relies on trust. Um, it, 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 without trust, people simply will use services less. They will say less. They will fear more. Um, and and I, right now we have a debate that is largely focused, I think, on negative incentives um, characterized by a lack of trust, an increase of suspicion, uh, and a fairly continuous stream of revelations, which I think we all realize will continue for quite some time. It's understandable that this would generate a lot of, of unhappiness. But I think it also obscures a few fundamental things that we share in common which is that we all would want to trust the online world more rather than less for social and for commercial purposes. That the further development and spread of the Internet for those who have yet to go online, which is more than half the human family, is a shared goal. So efforts which make that more expensive or more difficult are not welcome. That legitimate law enforcement efforts as relates to crime of whatever nature that societies decide need to be interdicted is a reasonable activity. That fundamental transparency in government operations is important, even if there is a tension about the relative level of transparency in some respects of government activity. Uh, we want our national constitutional protections of rights to privacy and the like to have real meaning, online and offline. We want to enjoy the internationally protected human rights that are pretty universally accepted, even if they are not always universally observed as we would like. These are profound, common, shared needs. And perhaps we can find a way to use them as a basis for a constructive conversation about the role of security services and, and law enforcement online as it relates in particular to the everyday lives of individuals especially those who are not employed by the government or in government service. And the debate we have right now, I don't think leads to a positive end for the Internet community and especially for the Internet. But as a community, we have the knowledge and the incentive to work to change that debate. I hope that can be another shared interest that we can build on, recognizing, of course, that criticism of government behavior is a fundamental right of all, and there must be room for such criticism. But to return to my original point, governments have a responsibility not to allow surveillance of their nationals to get out of control. And ironically, in a digital age, for those national protections to mean anything, that responsibility really cannot end at your national border, because if it does, the result counterintuitively is that if everyone but you is spying on your nationals, how can you say that your national constitutional protections have meaning anymore? They have even less meaning because you have no idea who knows what and is doing what uh, in relation to you. Um, 
In that vein, I think the, you know, the, the, the explanations we've heard from Ambassador Fonseca of, of the Brazilian initiative are welcome. Uh, a conversation about what we share, the beliefs we share, is not something we should fear. It's, I think, essential if we are to meet this conundrum of an analog past meeting a digital future in terms of... of thank you, Nick. Uh, I think we will uh, we'll have now to move. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your excellent intervention. We will try to tap this enormous expertise in the room, um, experience, expertise, and knowledge. And we will uh, bef uh, we will uh, we would like to ask you for your your uh, comments and questions. I think there is one person in the room who comes from the organization that can help us to address these balancing acts in the surveillance issues. We already heard about human rights aspect, security aspect, and data protection. And Council of Europe is an organization with, which has under its one roof three conventions and three institutional mechanisms for covering cybersecurity, data protection, human rights. I don't know if somebody from Council of Europe, Jan Malinowski or somebody is here. Jan, could, they, could you give us just a quick uh, remark a uh, few tweets, few points, how to uh, address this balancing act between different aspects. It has been underlying theme throughout the discussion. Please. Yes, I, <coughs> we, sorry, it seems to be a bit complicated. Hello? Yes. And other question? The, the Council of Europe approach, I think, mirrors in many respects uh, the, the different dimensions that have been mentioned here already. And, uh, and uh, I wouldn't go into that. I think that in substantive terms, what uh, Johan Hallenberg has said uh, is, is valid and, uh, and it does exemplify the, the different responses of the Council of Europe. But the, the Council of Europe approach, I think, can be described as uh, multi-stakeholder. One has to listen uh, in order to deliver good governance. One has to uh, listen to the different voices and leave whoever is responsible for something to take the decisions, but uh, taking into account everything that others have to, have to say. The Council of Europe uh, response is multidisciplinary. Uh, there are different interests and different issues that need to be addressed in respect of any one topic and in this context, we see that there are issues relating to national security, to privacy, to freedom of expression, uh, to crime, to rule of law. All of them need to be taken into account, and that requires a, a broad vision. There are, in the Council of Europe, multiple responses. There are, in addition to dialogue, there are responses that go through the intergovernmental uh, negotiation line, with soft law, with recommendations. Uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle mentioned some of them. There are a host of others that would apply to, to this. And there is hard law. There is international treaty law as well. Uh, we have the Cybercrime Convention. It has been mentioned. We have the Data Protection Convention. And above all, we have the European Convention on Human Rights that encompasses all of it. It goes all the range uh, from, from uh, freedom of expression to others. And we have... Uh, multiple accountability responses as well. We have political uh, accountability, we have legal accountability in the court, we have uh, discussions in the specialized committees, in the data protection committee, in the cybercrime committee, and so on. In connection with the Snowden case in particular, the Council of Europe does not have a response or has not given or attempted to give a response at this stage. But there are two things that I would like to draw your attention to in that respect. Already from the 70s, the European Court of Human Rights has uh, made it clear that a system of mass surveillance can undermine or even destroy democracy under the cloak of protecting it. I think that is a very important statement. As I said, it relates to cases uh, well before Snowden, well before the Internet. And the, the other aspect, uh, which is very relevant to the Snowden affair, is that the Council of Europe cares about whistleblowers. 
whistleblowers who disclose information in the public interest should be protected. And I think that the discussions that we are having demonstrate that Snowden has made revelations and disclosures that are in the public interest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, for this input and uh, giving us some uh, food for thought for addressing this main dilemma. If we have in the same room people from cybersecurity, data protection community, and human rights community, what is the way to address the question of Internet surveillance? And we will be facing it more and more, that interprofessional dialogue. We, do we have any? I saw some hands over there. Khalid, uh, please. And uh, over there, yes. Thank you, Jovan. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Khaled Fatal. I'm a group chairman of the Multilingual Internet Group. Um, the issue that I see in front of us here is not about um, alleged or not alleged. It really goes to the core and to the values of what multi-stakeholderism stands for. Many who attend ICANN would remember that I, I took the, uh, the lead on uh, making this a, a topic that needs to be addressed by ICANN, by the international community during the ICANN Durban, raising the issue that unless we deal squarely with the issue of surveillance, we are not uh, uh, giving the true value of how damaging it is to multi-stakeholderism. This is like a cancer scare to the trust of the multi-stakeholderism we all believe in. We believe, many of us, believe in multi-stakeholderism from an altruistic point of view, and we believe in privacy, freedom online. You know, I'm, I'm a Syrian American and nobody needs to lecture me on, on, on the importance of democracy and, and, and privacy and freedom of expression. But when the values are being challenged of what this stands for, I think it's time to come to terms with greater acknowledgement of what damage has been done and how to fix it is required. In emerging markets, we're embarking on major events in emerging markets. This is the subject matter that people want to talk about at many levels of society. And unless we deal with it very, very squarely, very, very uh, uh, um, uh, uh, at a high priority level, we will not be able to defuse the situation. Because so far all I see is an attempt to defuse, let people get it off their chest, the values of what we stand for is really what's at stake. I just close with this one remark. The war against terror was angled at our values versus theirs. The war against terrorism, it's our values versus theirs. What does it say that in pushing towards a free and open Internet, we discover we are spying on the rest of the world. It's, again, going back to the values. Please take note, a cancer scare get not, get, does not get treated with an aspirin. It needs an acknowledgement of what had happened and an, a desire and a genuine desire and process it puts put in place to show this is being addressed and fixed rather than just being a, an attempt to diffuse. This is my recommendation because all of us who believe in this do not want to see this multi-stakeholderism damaged. I would close with that remark. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid. Contributing to the fifth basket on ethics and trust, importance of trust and values in addressing uh, Internet surveillance, and uh, we will try to organize our discussion along these the main five lines. Please, could you introduce yourself, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I believe we have... Uh, uh, could you introduce yourself? Yes. Mm. Okay. My name is uh, Ren Yisheng. I'm from the Foreign Ministry of China. 
I, I was going to introduce myself in, in my mother tongue Chinese because I believe we have interpretation in the room. So please put on your earphone. <laughs> Not all of you have earphones. Okay, maybe I can start by, by making my intervention in English while you are preparing, getting your earphones. Um, I have a couple of points to make. Number one, we all have consensus on the uh, common values of the universality of, or universal value of human rights. Uh, on the other hand, that uh, we, 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 we would also like to stress that uh, uh, human rights concept is an, is, is an integral I mean, a concept is a whole concept that we should not neglect the other parts or elements of human rights, which is to say that we have two sets of rights, right? Civil political rights, economic, social, and cultural rights, uh, and, and in fact, the right to development. On the other hand, also, there is a check and balance of rights. We have rights. On the other hand, we have our obligations, responsibility, our obligation, our responsibility to the society, to... Uh, to respect uh, the rights of others, at least. This is the first point I want to make. The second point is on Internet. I think that we have so many elements, so many factors that we need to look at. Um, uh, there is, at least uh, in my view, that we have many elements that we need to look at. For example, the right to access. I think this is a very important uh, issue for many countries, uh, the developing countries in particular. I'm glad that you are getting your earphones so that I can switch back to my mother tongue language Chinese. Um,既然大家都有耳机了，我现在用中文发言。在过去几天里头。这个IGF讨论了很多重要的跟互联网发展有关系的问题 那么同时今天我们讨论的问题，以及在过去这几天里大家讨论的一个很重要的一个问题，就是个别国家对其他国家进行大大规模的这个监测的问题。我们向其他的代表团一样，对这个问题的极其的关注，极其的震惊。我们
，我们我们我们认为需要大家的参与，排除任何一个利益方，对这个互联网的治理的进程都是不利的。谢谢。Thank you, sir, for uh, your patience with our technical facilities and readiness to address us in English. And uh, I think you reiterated quite a few important principles for our uh, discussion and uh, elements of trust, uh, human rights in understood in comprehensive way, question of uh, sovereignty, and I think we have uh, quite a few interesting points for the further reflections. Uh, do we have any other? Oh, we have intervention here from. Am I audible? Okay. Hi, is, is the mic working? Okay. okay. Um, my name is Subhi Chaturvedi and I teach communication and new media technology at a university in India. It's a women's college um, and we run a foundation called Media for Change. The issues that we primarily look at is how the internet and new media technologies can empower developing countries. I thank Raul once again for organizing this session because we're looking at some of the most important questions that go to the heart of the matter. At the core of the internet is trust. The fact that we can trust this wonderful empowering technology which data which is immensely and increasingly private, personal and confidential. I do want to raise a couple of points here. When we start talking about situations such as these, um, I'm reminded of a story, and we all grew up reading Sherlock Holmes, and one of the stories was about why the dog didn't bark. And this was about how we've decided to keep quiet at moments such as these. And when we are faced with uncomfortable situations, we decide to take positions. This is an important moment, and I can't agree more with what Khalid had to say. This is about trust, but this is also about working in a space which is collaborative. And I do not believe that cybersecurity and concerns around sovereignty can exist in isolation without the consideration for individual rights of states and citizens. And I do want to reiterate that this journey from being the slave to the citizen has been a long one. And when we come to this point, uh, data collection by governments for what purpose, by whom, and for how long, and where is it going to be kept. When we create honeypots such as these, these are questions that we worry about, from not just from the human rights perspective. And I come from India. We have laws to protect children and women and vulnerable communities in particular. And we have just had two 18-year-old girls go to jail for updating a status. Um, because they decided to voice their dissent. And this is all for our own good, which is what I hear increasingly more often from governments across the world. But I do want to say that two wrongs don't make a right. But what we have with us is a wonderful process, which is bottoms up, inclusive, and multi-stakeholder. Yes, there might be problems in the current system, but that does not mean that we privilege one stakeholder, which is largely the government, and um, most of us do not know then when these conversations take place whether our voices would be heard. Democracy is a wonderful thing and a participatory democracy is an even better one. But it's not the same as multi-stakeholderism. Um, I think we've got a solution. We have a platform. Let's acknowledge this. Let's take it from here. And let's keep working with this platform. But let us work to reinforce the system that we have in multi-stakeholderism. I think that is the only way forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for bringing Sherlock Holmes into our discussion as well. May I? Sure. So my very brief question is for Mr. Scott Busby. I was uh, really pleased to hear a changed uh, statement or a changed tone from the U.S. Uh, government. And uh, I hope and I believe that uh, it, is, it is a reflection of the changed mindset within the U.S. government towards surveillance and uh, human rights and privacy. Uh, and if that's indeed the case, uh, I would like to ask you uh, that at the center of this whole, at the center of these developments is a man called Snowden, whom uh, Mr. Obama has referred to as a traitor. 
Is that still the position or has that position changed? Are these, is this changed uh, tone from the U.S. reflective also of the position on Snowden? Because it's, a, it's an important human rights issue. I mean, Snowden as a cause and Snowden as an individual. I'm talking about Snowden as an individual. What does the U.S. government want to do with him? That's my very brief question and I would like that answer. Thank you. May I? Okay. Um, my name is um, Jimmy Schultz, and I was a member of the German Parliament until Tuesday and the Committee for Internal Affairs and uh, Home. And uh, I've been, um, well, taking care of the issue since uh, it occurred. Um, it was sad. Uh, the whole thing uh, of surveillance is not new. It was sad that others do that too. That's true. That doesn't make it better, and that's no excuse. Um, a question to Google. Um, you said uh, you don't give direct access. Hmm. Um, that sounds, which sounds a little bit like Keith Alexander said in last year's DEF CON, we don't spy on every American. Um, what does that mean, we don't give direct access? Is there any indirect access? Um, uh, because you've talked about legal interception. Are, there, are you forced by any law not to tell us everything? That's a question to Google. Um, to the rep U.S. representative, um, Keith Alexander said earlier this year, those who encrypt are treated as potential terrorists. Therefore, I am a potential terrorist. Do you think I am a potential terrorist? Um, and, and you said, also said some countries are taking advantage of the situation. Does this uh, apply to Germany? Um, because I think the whole thing is an, is an earthquake in our relationship. Friends don't do that. Um, and you said you are uh, taking um, recommendations. Um, I give you something which is not a recommendation. Stop surveillance now. Um, but to be um, more um, coming to the point, um, I think we have to take three steps. First of all, I expect and I, I think we need complete transparency. Complete transparency is which means we, you have to tell us everything and everyone has to be open on that issue. Second, what we need are international um, contracts that friends don't spy on friends. And third, and this is uh, um, a thing we, we really should do is encrypt all our communication so surveillance won't work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Minister. Hello. So I'm Everton Lucero with the Brazilian government. Uh, I think we are dealing with a situation now that uh, requires clarity in terms of what we need to address in the future so as we avoid that it will ever happen again. I mean, the unprecedented mass surveillance and unauthorized monitoring of communications of millions of citizens worldwide by one intelligence agency of one single country has naturally revealed something. First, I agree that uh, it reveals we do not have a technological gap to fill in. This is an ethical and a political question. We have an institutional gap, clearly, because the only way that we will avoid this to happen again is if we agree in a set of principles and norms and an institutional framework that would, on the one hand, recognize legitimate multi-stakeholder processes and, on the other hand, uh, create an ethical ground for every actor to behave in the future in a way that will not damage human rights and privacy of any citizen in the world based on uh, any grounds. In particular, when it comes to national security, 
I believe this argument does not stand for it any longer, since you may uh, hardly conceive a situation in which uh, normal Brazilian citizens or companies or authorities are uh, violated in their privacy. Uh, is that done in the name of national security? And how come? Does that mean that there is a suspicion that millions of Brazilian citizens and Brazilian companies and authorities are somehow involved with terrorism or any other activity that may be harmful to national security of other countries? Uh, as a Brazilian citizen and as a Brazilian public servant, to me these are questions that are still to be answered. And the only thing we can uh, proceed with this in order to create a new vision is to get together all the stakeholders and think deeply about how to make sure that we will agree on a minimum core set of rules and principles that will become the norm and that will be observed from now on so that this situation will not repeat itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Macero. I am going to ask for your forgiveness uh, for a few minutes. Given what uh, Everton said, I would like to call on our uh, commenter, um, Maggie. If Maggie is a specialist also of uh, um, the right of Internet users, so we would like to hear from him now. Thank you. Thank you, moderator and chairman. As I myself is a information technology lawyer, so my comment will much on legal aspects. Uh, I think our discussion should move forward, not just start in debates where the short feelings is accepted or not accepted, but on how uh, to make Internet still free and open despite surveillance activities. One of the issues is the striking the balance of rights, the rights of security and the rights of privacy and freedom of expression. However, to make a global, globally accepted sets of standards, principles and rules to striking the balance of those rights seems difficult because Despite human rights is accepted as universal rights, but the applications of human rights are differs from places to places. Also, the threat of security issues also different from countries to countries. For example, freedom of expression. Uh, and the U.S. is regarded as, quote, unquote, the most important right because protected under First Amendment. But privacy in the U.S. is not clear whether it's protected under U.S. Constitution. At least it's not written on the U.S. Constitution, despite there are some interpretations that privacy is constitutional right in the U.S., on the, on the contrary, in European countries, privacy is much important, and there are some sets of legitimate re limitation of the applications of freedom of expression. We know that there are margin of appreciations that apply in applications of the freedom of expression in European countries. In Asia, privacy and freedom of expression seems not a strong right and not strongly protected. Government of Asia, like Indonesia, pay more attention on security than freedom of expression, also privacy. Some experts say that privacy don't have cultural roots in Asia, like Indonesia. So regarding to the matter of facts, it seems difficult to set up a globally accepted 
role to striking the balance of the rights. Thank you. In, sorry. Uh, however, democratic supervision to the surveillance activity is very important. Uh, maybe the surveillance activity have to be commissioned by Parliament to make sure the surveillance technology is not abused by government. It is important because technology of surveillance has been proved to be abused by some government of em Emirate Arab Union and Bahrain. According to the report of Reporters on Frontiers, FinFIS, a surveillance technology provided by United Kingdom company named Gamma Group International, is misused to monitor journalists, bloggers, and activists in this country. There is also a report that Malaysia used such surveillance technology to monitor the activities of opposition parties prior to the general election last year. And Indonesia just signed the contract with Gamma Group International on September this year, and we should make sure that Indonesian government don't use the surveillance technology to monitor the opposition activities on the election next year. Thank you. Uh, for our next speakers who are there queuing, just a few ideas that you could think of. One is this question of balancing act, and we just heard that balancing act is not the same in Europe Asia, United States and other places between security and privacy. Second point, we have the rules on uh, privacy protection in international covenant on civil and political rights. And as Everton indicated, there is a question how to apply it. Oh. What are the mechanisms? One more how, point, please. How we, how we can make the next, next step. Therefore, while you are waiting in the queues, think about these two issues. Balancing act in different regions and how we can move from applying the, these general rules to the problem that exists. Thank you. Thank you, Shuman. <clears throat> My name is Raul Echeverria. I'm the CEO of LACNIC. Um, I think that some uh, consensus uh, seems to be emerging from the discussion. Uh, one thing is that it seems that all of us agree that uh, massive surveillance is uh, something bad. and It is uh, something that should not be done, no matter who does it, and no matter what is, are the motivations for doing it. And there is also a kind of consensus that some kind of uh, investigations should be permitted using technology, but that the, this kind of um, use of technology should be done based on the respect of uh, human rights, uh, giving the due process warranty to everybody. And I have heard many people speaking, using almost the same words about principles and the, that any use of technologies for this kind of purpose should be done in, in the framework of uh, certain principles. And so here is my question for all the panelists, because uh, it seems that uh, the speech of the representative of the Swedish government uh, was very interesting and it seems to me that they are applying this uh, concept. And so my question for all the panelists is, could be uh, um, what uh, the Swedish government is doing uh, a basis for continue developing this concept and trying to get a solution in, um, in the future? I'm not... Uh, expecting to have a full agreement today about the principles, but probably we can get a sound of a kind of uh, um, uh, common view in this, uh, in, in this session uh, about that this is the path uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matthew Shears with the Center for Democracy and Technology. Just a couple of quick comments back on what we've heard so far. Let's not trivialize this discussion. I've heard others are worse. NSA envy, alleged hypocrisy. When we use the sentence, others are worse, that's no justification for our own surveillance, mass surveillance. When we say NSA envy, that's pretty serious stuff because there are countries out there who are exactly saying that. This is not a joke. 
And it is hypocrisy. It's not alleged. So let's be clear on this. Second, thank you to the representative from the government of Sweden for saying there is no balancing act. We've waited a long time for someone to say there is no balancing act. Respecting human rights increases security. Diminishing human rights diminishes security. Three, Frank LaRue, to paraphrase him, I'm sure very poorly, says that mass surveillance not only makes a mockery of human rights, but threatens the very foundations of our societies and the rule of law. Let's remember that. It's very important. And finally, I don't know about everybody else here, but I have not lost my trust in the Internet. Let's stop saying that. I've lost my trust in the institutions that use the Internet for the purposes of undermining my fundamental rights. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Pinder Wong from Hong Kong. Uh, as you know, Hong Kong has been uh, where Snowden chose to make his re uh, revelations. Um, my question really, also, a question is about forgiveness. Um, partly because uh, as a long-time Internet participant, I think it's what's been demonstrated as spying on an open network or surveillance on a network, uh, low-hanging fruit. We really shouldn't be surprised. What we are surprised on about is the scale. And so I'll echo what Jimmy Schultz's intervention in terms of full disclosure. I think so. those of us who have kids have known that kids make mistakes. And although the Internet is in its adolescence, Looking forward, clearly there's been a mistake that has been made. So a starting point really is that full disclosure. It may be naive to ask it. I'm not saying who discloses to whom, but it is a basis of recognizing that you've made a mistake, coming clean, and then going forward. But what is that going forward? What is that vision? I don't agree with the previous intervention by the CDT guy. There is no balancing act. It is to have a very clear vision of the future that we wish to build. And I think I would suggest that whilst there is a temptation to fall within our national boundaries, to go back to what I would call a pre-internet era, let's not forget the opportunity before us, the opportunity to really build trade. And let us view things in positive terms. The next one and a half billion people perhaps will be coming on the internet through their mobile phones, making payment over the mobile, over that mobile network. And so let's not also look at the issue of routing money over the internet. So trade, money, these are all very important issues, and those issues, if we have a vision of our future, we can, I would hope, find forgiveness, because I'm not surprised of the surveillance, I'm surprised about the scale. But let's find mechanisms to re-establish trust, and let's look at how we can do so through the old 70s concept, peace through trade. Thank you. Just a quick correction to the scribes. Please correct in the final version. The name of the gentleman who just spoke is Pindar Wong. Thank you. Uh, Mike Gerstein from the Community Informatics Network. Um, I'm from Canada. It's a global network. Uh, about a month ago, I wrote a blog post uh, arguing that, or pointing out that the Internet was, in fact, a two-way system uh, and that uh, the National Security Agency, while drawing information from the Internet, was also fully capable of putting information into the Internet and having significant impacts uh, in many of the places, if not most of the places, where it was drawing information from. Uh, in the meantime, we've had confirmation of that, uh, two, two uh, direct confirmation, one being uh, the fact that uh, Mr. Cheney's heart pacer uh, was uh, um, uh, made hacker-proof, uh, because of fears that uh, using the Internet, it was possible to interfere with his uh, pacemaker and uh, assassinate him in that way. That came out recently. The second was the, the use of the Internet and Internet surveillance 
as a direct input into uh, the drone wars that's being conducted in various parts of the world as guidance systems and as direction systems for these drone wars. I guess my observation, it's not really a question, uh, is that I think we're dealing with something far more serious than simply surveillance. I think we're, 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 we're dealing with the potential for uh, the active intervention uh, in spurious and potentially dangerous ways uh, into whatever elements of the Internet that we use for whatever purposes in, that we choose to in, in our daily lives, including our banking, our health records, uh, our, inter our, our internal organizational communications, our financial communications, and so on and so forth, so that whatever response that's developed into the issues of surveillance also have to take into account the issues of aggressive and offensive actions by those who are in a position to undertake this kind of surveillance. Thank you. And the speaker's name was Michael Gerstein, G-U-R-S-T-E-I-N. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Walter Natwis. I'm here on behalf of uh, NL IGF and reporting back from some sessions we had which are relevant to this discussion. I think one of the main things that came up in the two panels we did is that internet is becoming more and more a part of our lives and then is it a time to, to start acting towards the internet as if it is normal and not something which is far away from us and Unseeable. So, in other words, if that is true, then what goes on in regular life also goes for Internet life. So that would mean that there's a triangle of economic development on one side, and the other side there's security, and the other last part is freedom. So, in other words, if you treat it like that, then economic development becomes possible, and the Internet becomes safer, because there are so many best practices we heard of, that it's about time that we stop talking and start to act upon those best practices. And I won't call them here which ones they are, but they're in the transcripts. And we really heard some excellent ones. And some things that really came forward is that if governments want the Internet to be safer, then start showing leadership through showing the best practice. So we did a headcount saying who actually orders software off the shelf or who says I wanted to have this, this or these qualities before you can sell it to me and only the commercial parties showed their hands saying we're doing these sort of demands on software and all the governments were looking what are we talking about. So in other words if you want leadership on security for the internet then start showing it yourself by demanding security before you buy something from the, in the internet and the last comment I would like to make is that we try to envision how large the table should be if you want to have all parties discussing Internet governance. And we probably have a table as long as this whole up and down and still not enough. And about 50% of the people won't know each other and still they're responsible for making the same product. So how do you get these sort of people at the table? Maybe never. But said, let's start with software developers because they're hardly here in the IGF discussion. They're hardly ever there. So governments, you could show leadership in security by bringing the right people to the room in your country or regionally or internationally and start discussing security with the right people because that's the only way to make the Internet more secure. And that was one of the comments made by the IETF, which I think made some excellent comments during this, this IGF, and I was very happy to hear them. So thank you. Thank you for the last two presentations, bro. The bro, the uh, context for this issue and the importance of uh, this issue of surveillance also for individuals and the way they use the internet. Now we have the next speaker over there. Good, mor good morning. My name is John LaPreeze. I'm a professor at Northwestern University. As a scholar and a historian, I'm really surprised that so many states are so surprised by at the, the scope of the NSA surveillance. And I'd just like to offer to those states that perhaps you better take a better look at your uh, intelligence gathering uh, entities in your own countries because they're either demonstrating incompetence in terms of not seeing the, the history of intelligence gathering or they're, they, ne they know about it and are not saying anything in which case they're guilty of collusion. Either way, you have a few problems to remedy in your own countries for your own intelligence organizations. Thank you. 
Thank you. But nothing, not, nothing new under the sun? <laughs> Thank you. My name is Norbert Bolo, speaking in personal capacity right now as a human being who cares about my human rights. I start by echoing some remarks that have been made. We should not try to balance human rights and security. We need security that protects our human rights, our ability to fully experience our human rights. We already have a good set of international human rights standards. What we need is the ability to effectively enforce them. This requires, as it has been said, full transparency. And I think it requires an international treaty of sorts to deal with these widespread transborder human rights violations that we have experienced. And perhaps most importantly, we need to get serious about looking at the technical side of metadata encryption. This is much more difficult technically than encrypting communications content. I am absolutely convinced it can be done, but it requires a fundamental rethinking of the architecture that we use for communicating via the Internet. So I propose the creation of a dynamic coalition of metadata privacy protection. Thank you. Thank you. We have the last two comments, and then we'll pass the floor to the panelists. And last three comments, I'm sorry. My name is Mark Putty. I work for the London Internet Exchange, and my comments are informed by this, but I'm speaking entirely on my own behalf. I think that we've heard a great deal of cant about the surveillance issue. It is plainly, and always has been, the proper purpose of intelligence agencies to gather information about foreign countries and their activities, and so far as they affect the essential national interest and the proper business of security services to identify and do something about those that would cause us harm. What has changed, however, is that it is now being said that these proper purposes can only be pursued if the intelligence and security agencies know essentially everything about everyone. This has never been the previous approach of anything except totalitarian societies. And if the heads of intelligence and security services cannot be persuaded that their mission can be pursued in other fashion. I hope that the political leaders will understand that the reaction that is being built around the world here shows that it's worth more than the beliefs of the appropriate way to pursue their mission on the part of those authorities. It is undermining our friends and allies. Secondly, and finally, The activities that work to undermine the protective security mechanisms, in particular undermining fundamental encryption standards, do not merely help the intelligence and security agencies identify those that would do us harm, but generally advance the interests of those who would penetrate information systems and undermine those who would protect them. Fundamentally, this is a core trade-off for the national security interest. I would urge you to consider the consequences to business as well as to citizens of making flaws generally available as they are becoming generally available to those that would penetrate information systems, whether they they be state or non-state actors. This is an own goal. Thank you for your attention. Uh, My name is Pranish Prakash. I work with the Center for Internet and Society in India and with the Yale Information Society project. While issues of human rights, privacy, and surveillance will be dealt with at the national level, and there are some indications that in some cases they are being dealt and reforms are, uh, will be attempted at least, we need to agree that privacy is a right that belongs not just to the citizens of one country or another, but no one country should be able to deny me the right of being human, 
that privacy is indeed a human right and not and, and a country can't escape its international human rights obligations by saying that we are safeguarding the privacy of our own citizens and only our own citizens. Second point I want to make is that mass surveillance at the level of internet infrastructure and architecture as is being done by countries like our friends in the West and India are contrary to the UDHR and ICCPR and it's non-targeted, non-proportionate, non-reasonable nature makes it an arbitrary or unlawful interference in the enjoyment of privacy. That this is contained in itself in international human rights doctrine that mass surveillance of the sort that we are seeing today especially at the level of the internet infrastructure just is not legal thank you very much thank you very thank much you. my name is Juriani I'm from Indonesia um, during the last few days we have heard and um, listened to many challenges that portrayed by multi-stakeholders multi uh, in the internet field. However, um, we also came up with the common views that trust and cooperation are of important issues that we should address. We have the problem of trust there, but we cannot stop just right there. So um, we need to think what IGF as the one of maybe the most um, uh, forum that involve many various uh, multi-stakeholders uh, worldwide, the only one, that we need to think what IGF could offer in the future, what IGF can do in the future in leading the role of setting up principles or norms that are agreeable by all stakeholders. Um, because in this uh, multi-stakeholder forum, uh, it's not only to, to speak out what your interests are, it's not only a forum to, uh, to tell everybody else what your concerns are, but we need to understand what other interests are. So therefore, IGF should, bridge, um, should be a bridge for all stakeholders to be a forum where everybody can understand each other. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andres Aspurua. I come from Venezuela as part of ISAC Ambassadors Program. My country is a relatively small country with human rights problems. It makes little no sense in making decision if you have human rights problems or challenges as they like to be said here. It doesn't make any sense distinguishing it if they're online or offline. So I would like to put my perspective on many of the subjects we've been talking in this IGF from the perspective of small countries that are not frequently represented in, in this forum or that their issues are not usually commented too much. It's a little sad when governments defend their actions by saying that they only target foreigners as if they were not, they were not subject to human rights and the International, the International Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, I'm also really sad to see that the U.S., who had a very strong internet freedom agenda in pushing it throughout the world, now lacks a moral authority to keep doing that. I think it's time for other countries to step up if they decide not to change their policies. Mass surveillance and other advanced persistent threats that are more targeted are being used not only by big governments, also by small ones. In the case of these governments, usually the controls and oversights are even more, even more weak than in the widely famous cases that we've all been discussing. So it will be of much help for countries like mine to actually know what's getting into our countries because most of this technology doesn't come from our own industries or our own techno tech industries. It comes from developed nations or nations with stronger IT industries. So more controls and transparency in, in those imports and exports would definitely help activists like myself. So I'm, I said I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just an activist with a tech background. 
And for me, it's obviously clear that mass surveillance should be treated as a huge human rights transgression. So I hope that in the meantime, we learn to use encryption correctly to protect ourselves, our colleagues, and our work. I hope that for next idea, for next meetings of this kind, we'll see a lot of more PGP uh, fingerprint keys on business cards so that we could start to share the, the knowledge on how to communicate effectively and securely. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we're going to go to the um, online remote participation. Subi? Um, we have a question. Um, there's one from Twitter which talks about um, what is it that governments can do. Um, and there is another one which relates to the same theme of ethics and trust. And this is a question to European governments. Um, Sweden, as a representative of Europe regarding the individual Snowden issue, um, who has done a great service to the global public in making this information accessible, do European countries consider him to be a whistleblower who needs to be protected or is he to be considered a traitor who should not receive protection? Would any European country, any member of the Council of Europe, now be willing to grant Snowden asylum? Thanks very much. So um, I think we're going to wrap up a little bit with Jovan, and then we're going to give the floor to our panelists to respond to some of the questions that we've had. Um, Jovan? Well, uh, there were, I think there, were, there was quite a high level of consensus of the both problems and main issues and, and the controversies. And here are a few points. There is agreement that about the severity of the, of the problems. I think it was uh, echoed in all intervention comments. And also highlighted that there is a question of trust, fundamental trust, as an underlying element for the success and the future development of the Internet. Second point, uh, I think we agree that there are existing rules in international law that cover this issue. And there is Article 17 of the International Covenant on Political and Civil Rights saying clearly that no one should be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his privacy, and so on. The international law exists. As we know, international law is sometimes not easily applicable. And then we come to the next point, which was raised in many comments from Bertrand, from Everton, how to apply international law. What are the procedures? And here the key words were uh, check and balances, introduce check and balances, have full transparency, use the due process, uh, observe the rule of the law, and uh, have institutional division, as, uh, as Johan from the Sweden mentioned, between different players in this field. Therefore, that will be the main challenge. And one can argue that maybe some new reporting mechanism of existing conventions should be introduced or it should be introduced in universal periodical review in the work of the UN Council of Human Rights. Therefore, we are speaking about the way how to implement existing rules. There was a bit of a, uh, there are quite a few different views about possibility of having win-win or solution or balancing act. We should act and we should aim for a win-win solution by achieving human rights protection through more security. But we should be equally ready to have uh, some balancing acts be because it is reality of political life. What are the next steps? First, we are waiting for the um, uh, results of the review process uh, in the United States. Uh, in the meantime, there are quite a few international initiatives in the UN uh, Human Rights Council, and it will be moving on, especially on the issues on protection of privacy and data protection. And uh, we should start exploring some national models like Swedish model for uh, tackling these issues and these delicate balances between security, human rights, and data protection. And it was clear from the all interventions the topic is extremely important, and the IGF should find ways and means to continue discussion, including proposal to create dynamic uh, coalition dealing with these issues. I hope it reflected in a few tweets uh, what uh, was uh, the underlying messages. Please. I think there is one important issue that I should address when uh, my speak was cut. It's the 
liability and responsibility of technology technology providers. Uh, technology providers should ensure that the technology they provide to government not be misused by government. So there should be any legal remedy uh, if the technology used to uh, to surprise or to monitor the activity of activists or journalists. So there, there is the contract between the technology providers and government should be cover an article that saying that the government only use this technology for legitimate actions, not misuse, etc. Thank you. We'll start now with our uh, panelists answering the questions and commenting on overall discussion and also this underlying possible uh, elements for possible summary of uh, our discussion. Uh, I think we had the most questions uh, addressed to Scott. Scott, could you start, please? <laughs> Thank you, Hovind. I'm not sure I'm going to it's be. It's not surprising. I'm not. Good, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer them all, but I'll do my best. First of all, I want to thank my fellow panelists, commentators, as well as the audience for all of your many thoughtful comments and questions. Uh, the United States government is here in force. There are over 10 of us here. Uh, on the heels of a government shutdown, I mind you, at which there was travel restrictions on virtually every U.S. government agency, and I hope that demonstrates to all of you not only the seriousness with which we take the IGF, but the seriousness with which we take this issue. Uh, we intend to take back your comments, your questions, to report back to our senior leadership on what we've hear heard here with the goal of ensuring that those views are taken account of in the deliberations that are now taking place in the United States. Uh, second of all, to Khalid, who first made this point, but the woman from India as well, about the seriousness or potential lack of seriousness with which we take this issue. I don't think that President Obama and the rest of the U.S. government is not taking this issue seriously, is trying to deflect the President has taken extraordinary action in setting up this review board of independent experts to give him their best advice on how the U.S. should move ahead on this issue. As I just mentioned, the U.S. government has come here in force knowing that this issue was going to be the heart of the discussions of this IGF and willing to engage with you to hear you out on this issue. So we take very seriously this issue. Uh, with regards to transparency, which several uh, commentators uh, mentioned, the President has already ordered that as much transparency about what, it, what the NSA has been doing, uh, the judicial orders relating to the NSA activities, that those be released. And indeed, you can find those online. If anyone wants to know the, uh, the site where they can be found, I'd be happy to, to send that to them. On Edward Snowden, I don't have anything to say on that beyond what President Obama has already said, so I would refer the questioner uh, to what, uh, what President Obama has said. Uh, on China, on our intervention from a colleague from China, I would simply uh, ask anyone who has questions about the human rights situation in China and the human rights situation in the United States to look at any independent human rights report on these issues and draw their own conclusions. One of the best reports, I think, is the Freedom on the Net report issued by Freedom House. We have Freedom House here. There are copies of that report here. That report is critical of the United States, I would mind you. It's not often that a government official refers people to a report that's critical of the United States. I would urge people to look at that report and draw their own conclusions. Uh, to the Indonesian representative, the lawyer here, who asked about privacy in the United States. So interesting story here in the United States. For good or worse, we have a very old constitution in the United States, uh, older than most countries. And the concept of privacy actually postdates the creation of our constitution. So yes, the concept of privacy is covered by our constitutions, but it's covered through legal interpretations of that Constitution by our Supreme Court. 
And there are a slew of decisions uh, in the last century that essentially create this concept of privacy. And indeed, it is now considered a constitutional right. And lastly, there were several questions about the NSA and sort of the NSA out of control, being a state within a state. Uh, I would just, you know, urge folks to, to look at uh, what the president has said. The NSA and these activities are subject to judicial review. They are subject to legislative review. And the NSA finally is subject to the command and control of our commander-in-chief, namely the President of the United States. Uh, so uh, the President has uh, said what he intends to do uh, in this area. He has empowered a review panel to look at these issues, and we will be considering the recommendations of that review panel going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, now we go on to um, Ross. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I want to echo Scott's uh, sentiments that I've uh, enjoyed uh, today's panel and I particularly enjoy hearing uh, questions uh, from all of you. And so I've taken a couple of notes. I, I don't think I was as thorough as, as you were, Scott. But uh, to Jimmy's question, I, I appreciated that very much about direct access versus access. It's a very good point. When I meant we don't provide direct access, what I meant is that we really don't provide access to the infrastructure. I was trying to draw a distinction between that and the process I outlined that when we get a legal request from the government, we look at it thoroughly. And so it is possible for the U.S. government to get uh, user data, but only through that process that I outlined in my remarks. So thank you for that clarification. Um, there was a, uh, a comment or question uh, from a remote participant about user trust, and that is something that we are very focused on. It really is what um, drives everything we do at Google, so we're incredibly concerned about the impact of user's trust on us from the Snowden revelations. It, it drives everything we do. It's why we spend the resources that we do on our security infrastructure, on our encryption with search, you know, encrypted by design and Gmail being encrypted. Um, and I would make the point that I feel the cloud is certainly more secure than alternative models, as, as Bertrand um, characterized it, data sovereignty, data localization. The cloud is much more secure than that model. But this issue of user trust drives much more than our security infrastructure and, and uh, our technology. It, it, it drives the work we do on Internet governance, uh, our membership, our founding membership in GNI, which is a third party which audits the practices of companies. Uh, it drives our uh, development of things like Project Shield, which allows independent news sites and, and similar sites to take advantage of Google's uh, own security infrastructure uh, for those sites that have been subject to DDoS attacks and the like. And it drives our sponsorship of civil society and our work, which we do really in each and every country in which we have uh, uh, an office on free expression uh, from issues like intermediary liability in Thailand and India to even more challenging situations uh, in parts of Southeast Asia. Um, finally, to Matthew's uh, uh, intervention from CDT, as Matthew well knows, we are a strong partner of CDT on pushing for greater transparency in the United States, and we see I think very clearly eye to eye on that. And so I wanted to clarify uh, Matthew's point. When I said that others are doing it too, I thought I made it fairly clear about five or six times in my, in my comments, but I'm happy to say it again. I'm not trying to excuse or trivialize in any way the revelations that have come about about U.S. surveillance. But I am making the point that this is not just a U.S. issue, that this is happening everywhere around the world, and I think it would be unwise of us to focus solely on the U.S. surveillance program and not focus on the very real challenges that are occurring everywhere else around the world. So that was my point, and I thank Matthew for giving me the opportunity to clarify that. And I think, as I'm checking my notes, that was it. But someone correct me if I'm wrong. 
Thanks very much, Ross. Um, next on our panel is Johan. Okay. Thank you very much. A couple of um, points for me as well. Um, there, was, there was a question about um, the, 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 powerful, the powerful tools and resources that, if, if that has prompted any, any change in, in our society and any legislation. And the answer in my country is yes. Um, it certainly has, because that has created a new, all, all new um, uh, way of looking at this, of course. And um, around 10 years ago, um, discussions intensified in, in my country on, on how to find the, re the right uh, legislative framework for this. Uh, an area which uh, largely were unregulated before. Uh, so uh, after long negotiations, um, a draft law was, was presented. It was uh, thrown out of parliament, wasn't approved, back to government. It, again, the second draft wasn't approved because of, of, of uh, the, the parliament felt that uh, the, the protections for for privacy were, uh, were not good enough. Uh, the third draft eventually was approved in 2009. Um, this, uh, this law applies equally to, to everyone, every citizen. There was a question about, uh, about not making difference between uh, different nationalities. It applies equally to, to Swedes and non-Swedes. Non and it, it includes a fair amount of, of uh, uh, special mechanisms to protect individuals' privacy. Amongst other things, it includes a special, uh, a special court which takes a decision in every case of signals surveillance. This law is uh, now being put to the test in the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, it's been challenged and uh, we welcome this, of course. Uh, we welcome to hear if the court in Strasbourg finds it, uh, um, finds it lives up to the standards of, of the European Convention on Human Rights. There was a comment on Article 17 of the ICCPR. It is true, it establishes the, the fundament of the right to respect for private life, which is, I believe, the accurate, uh, the accurate um, uh, um, wording. Uh, we believe uh, there, there may very well be uh, reasons to look at Article 17 and see how we can increase our understanding of how Article 17 should be interpreted. There are a number of different uh, ways to do that, and uh, we are currently engaging in, in Geneva and in New York to find ways of promoting the best way forward. Um, finally, a, a few comments were made on the Swedish model. I'm not sure I really um, know what that would be, but if it refers to the fundamental principles that my minister uh, outlined uh, last week, we are more than happy to discuss on the basis of those the way to go forward. Um, and indeed, those, those principles uh, are integrated in our, in our law and in our framework. So in a way, it, well, I suppose it does represent the, the Swedish model. Finally, uh, I am not representing uh, any other country than my, my own country here on this panel, so I'm, I'm not in a position to, to speak on behalf of Council of Europe member states or European Union member states when it comes to, to Edward Snowden. Uh, I can just, I can just um, uh, conclude that uh, his, his human rights should be respected, period, uh, regardless of, of uh, the label that you give him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johan. Uh, Joanna, you've heard most of the comments. Would you like to have a, um, to say something more? Hi, I, ju I just would like to make some remarks for, for us to include the issue on whistleblowers in this panel report, because I believe it's an important human rights issue and that we are only here debating surveillance be because of them. And I would like to ask Scott and the U.S. government to give further thoughts uh, about this, that it seems penalties for whistleblowers are getting worse and worse, and I'm not referring only to Snowden, Chelsea Manning, who before was Bradley Manning, uh, that leaked information about the war in Iraq is in jail with 
35 year sentence after remaining tortured for three years without a sentence. And according to notes from the Guardian that I quote here, Manning's term is unprecedentedly long for someone convicted of leaking U.S. government documents compared, for example, to 10 years received by Charles, Charles Garner, the most sever, severely punished of those held responsible for the Abu Dhabi torture in Iraq. So Chelsea is in jail, is not is stuck in Russia. These people, uh, they had enormous importance for the countries we live today are being severely punished and in a dilemma between being traitor to a nation and providing openness and important information to the world, I think that most of people here with good faith and will would go for traitor. So, Thanks, Joanna. Um, so we've heard quite a few things, and we, I think we're going to give um, um, a few seconds, to, uh, minutes to our um, uh, respond, uh, commenters to respond. Um, and we're going to start with uh, Ambassador Fonseca. Is the mic around? Yes. Thank you. And very briefly, much has been said, and I don't have uh, much to add. Just also in reaction to what was proposed and the question that was uh, uh, formulated by Raul Echeverria from LACNIC, uh, I would like to comment that the uh, Swedish model, the, the, not the Swedish model, but the points that were raised by your Minister of External Relations at the CEO conference really provide a very good basis for our work on, in regard to the issue of privacy in relation to security, which is, of course, one of the uh, focus areas and core areas of the, the speech I present delivered at the United Nations, so we would be comfortable in working within this framework. But just to recall that we have proposed and the President has proposed we should aim at having a larger set of principles and take into account a huge amount of work that has already been done in that regard within different contexts. It has been mentioned the Council of Europe, we could refer to OECD. So we have different sets of principles, but of limited, uh, limited in scope of participation. So we are aiming at something of global nature that would encapsulate the core uh, norms and agreed principles that should guide us through. And just reiterate the invitation and the call for participation in the Brazilian uh, meeting to be held next year. And if you allow me just a very brief comment in regard to this, I was referring before to the kind of misunderstandings that sometimes occur. And the President has termed this meeting as a summit, and it must be understood that from the point of view of government, what we are aiming at is at a very high-level event that would wishfully be able to, to make kind of decision that could impact on, on uh, the, the, the work we are doing. So this is the, the meaning of saying a summit. It should not be uh, interpreted as meaning it's something exclusively for governments. I think uh, this is the kind of conceptual difference that sometimes must be spelled out. When we say summit, we, want, we mean a meeting that will be, we'll have authority enough to make decisions. And uh, at the same time, the President clearly also spelled out that she would expect civil society, private sector, all stakeholders to be represented, and I, I would dare to say on an equal level in, in, as regards the, the, any decision-making process that might, be, uh, might take place at, at that point, which we aim, of course, uh, at some kind of consensus. So this is uh, just very briefly to reiterate something I said before and to specify that as we go back, our president is due in the next few days to make an announcement on the basis of everything we heard and the very important inputs we have received and ideas that were presented here. Uh, I would not at this point like to anticipate anything the president will say. I think uh, sometimes we try to interpret it or what she has meant. I think it's as a disciplined civil servant, I would prefer the President herself to 
spell out. Of course, this will not be a, a decision or anything made in isolation, but fully take into account the multi-stakeholder aspect we, we want. But as the host uh, of the meeting, I think it would be the President's prerogative to decide, for example, on the summit aspect or not, and this is something yeah. we, we will invite uh, all to be there, and uh, again, the announcement will be made in the next few days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we will have a few, few, a few tweets, if it is possible, Nick and uh, Bertrand, and uh, we have one comment. Uh, but we are closing the plenary session and commentary. We are wrapping up, uh, and if it is of relevance for the wrapping up uh, comments that we will we'll hear. I, Please, th Thank Bertrand. you, Giovanna. I just wanted to, to reaffirm one element, that after this panel, it is clear that the answer to excessive surveillance cannot be the proliferation of national frameworks establishing data sovereignty, but rather increased oversight and increased due process respect and assessment of the impact of transboundary uh, action or impact assessment for any national measures that has a transboundary action. Thank you. Thank you. Nick, please. Um, yes, thank you also for, for inviting me to speak in general. Um, one thing that struck me here is that I think we have many different national approaches to surveillance and, and the protection of individuals in relation to it, but very little have I found published that actually spells out and contrasts the different choices countries have made and the reasons why they have made them. Uh, I know in Latin America, recent very uh, serious human rights violations by security services in, the, in, in living memory have made uh, this issue particularly sensitive in that region. Um, for example, and in Switzerland I know we, we had a similar scandal in the 90s that has greatly changed the way surveillance is conducted by Switzerland. Perhaps, and, and we've heard a bit about the, 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 the Swedish protections. Perhaps it would be useful to to have more clarity and be able to compare different systems and understand the choices that they made. And I would say also the Inter-Parliamentary Union uh, in Geneva, the, the home of the world's parliaments, perhaps should discuss this issue to see if the world's parliaments can share information, uh, understand each other better, and perhaps Thank that would help. Thank you, Nick. We'll have a, 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 a Chinese, uh, Chinese colleague and uh, after that we'll be closing discussion, otherwise I will be declared persona non grata, but IGF organizing committee will just uh, uh, receive alert from, the, from Marcus. Please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Marcus. Please. 所以我们中国代表团在发言的过程中间我就想举一下所以我们中国人民也享受着充分的言论自由的权利但是你发表的任何信息都不能够危害社会都应该遵守公德最起码的这个人的道德准则同时你不能散布有害于国家安全的的信息或者你也不能在网上散布谣言
，美国政府每年都发表关于全世界一百将近二百个国家和地区的人权状况的报告。他刚才推荐大家去看一看，但是美国政府的代表忽视了一点，他从来不发表他们自己国家的人权状况的报告，没有吧？从来没发表过。中国政府替美国政府做了这项工作是无偿的。中国国务院新闻办公室每年也发表美国的人权状况报告，欢迎大家去浏览。里面所有的信息都是美国媒体公开发表的。Thank you. 谢谢。Thank you. Thank you, sir. And on international level, there is also universal periodical review, which is useful mechanism to comparing.、Uh, Various situations worldwide when it comes to the human rights and the, as the, what, what we heard.、Uh, we are.、Uh, we, well, just tweet, tweet, tweet,、uh, half tweet. My name is Alex. I'm from the internet. It seems people in this room are concerned about eavesdropping.、Um, so I would just like to point out that、uh, if you registered online to attend the IGF,、uh, you have leaked your personal information, including date of birth. ID number or passport number and residential address,、uh, email address, full name. So、um, defences against these type of things really do start at home. You can see it on the APC website, apc.org. Thank you kindly. Bye. Thank you very much. Just another thing. Thank、tweet. you. My, my name is Ron Carlos Caribe. I'm from Brazil. I'm here to expect a tweet. Everyone is still under the perplexity of the size and the reach of American intelligence, and many are making decisions in the heart of emotion. And it's precisely this that worries me: decisions that are taken so passionately, decisions under this scenario generally are not so rational, and generally are hurting our hearts. I'm definitively. Not willing to give away any right in change for security. That's all. Closing the session with a poem and artistic、uh, addition to overall discussion. Well,、uh, so、um, what we're going to do right now, I think we're going to have、uh, Jovan、um, remind us a little bit some of the points that、um, were. Uh, uh, You know, raised here in answering. If you remember some of、uh, the questions that we had, that Marcus read, that、um, the session was also supposed to、um, address. And I would like to simply say that I think、uh, this session is uh, one um, that is、uh, again building bridges. You know,、um, this is the start of discussions, and I know that. And I've seen a few tweets where people are saying. Uh, we're not satisfied because there aren't really answers, and、uh, I don't think anybody expected really that we would have answers here this morning.、Uh, but at least conversations have started.、Um, you know, the start of a bridge is being built. As Ambassador Fonseca said,、um, you know, one of our next meetings might be will be in Brazil, and、uh, that could be a place where、um, at least some. General principles could be agreed upon, and、uh, then it will be up to all of us to actually, you know, just like the other general and global principles that we have, to make sure that we adhere to those.、Um, Jovan, with the, with the risk of confronting Twitter community, which is not a wise thing to do, I have to admit that、uh, there were quite a few answers and quite a few useful insights we heard about.、Uh, Experience in Sweden, Brazil,、uh, quite a few、uh, suggestions. We, there is agreement that there are international rules that cover these issues, and quite a few concrete、uh, suggestions how we can implement these rules through due process check and balances. Therefore, I would say that、uh, we, I personally feel quite comfortable with advancement of our discussion, much more than、uh, than expected before the session. And as you know, these problems are complex, and they're so-called weak problems. You don't have the can have a quick fix. There are many aspects: security, human rights, ethical, business that should be addressed. And Marcus gave us seven questions at the beginning of the session, which were.
questions posed through the public consultation, and uh, we answered all of those questions and even added quite a few more questions. Therefore, we will be um, having an interesting discussion. And if I can conclude with one point, uh, with a famous quote, don't waste the crisis, it seems that we are not going to waste this crisis, and uh, that uh, at least based on your inputs and panelist inputs, there is a serious uh, uh, determination and responsibility to do something useful for Internet as a whole and for humanity. First of all, to, in, uh, to avoid a situation like this one with the, with the NSA uh, case, but also to prevent similar situation happening worldwide. Therefore, there is an op opportunity that we shouldn't miss, and I think uh, quite a few players around the world are moving in that direction to create uh, space ideas and proposals that could uh, uh, make uh, Internet even a, a more powerful tool for enabling of the social and economic development worldwide. Thank you. Let, let me just add a quick word. I think the discussion A was certainly very interesting. This is a sensitive issue on top of the agenda and I think again the IG proved its value and its worth and this kind of discussion clearly is best held in a multi-stakeholder setting and I think it will not be over and we will revisit it at the next IGF. With that, Mr. Chairman, over to you to close the meeting. Thank you, Marcus. So thank you also, Madam Ina and Jovan for moderating this open discussion on emerging issue with focusing mainly on approach the role of security, surveillance, transparency, and privacy issue. If I may value this session, it's really the top of the top session of the IGF to 2013. If you look at the response from the floor, and also, they say, all the idea. As a piece of information that Indonesia also aware a positive impact of Internet as a means of economic development. However, it has become increasingly concerned over the impact of access of information and has demonstrated an interest in increasing its control over offensive online content, particularly pornographic and anti-Islam online content. The government regulates such content through legal and regulatory framework and through partnership with the ISP, Internet Service Provider, and also the Internet Cafe. Meanwhile, the Telecommunication Act 99 also prohibits the wiretapping of communication except ban necessary for obtaining evidence for criminal in investigation. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is my first IGF engagement with more, especially in Bali, 2,200 2, participants from 109 countries. So let us wait for our next IGF 2014. Wherever it will be held, I think we should come. And really, I enjoy this familyhood circumstances, and it's really a kind of realization of the spirit of multi-stakeholder cooperation of World Internet community. With this statement, I would like to conclude this meeting. And again, thank you for excellent moderating. And thank you also to our panelists and all participants for this valuable discussion. I hope you enjoy your stay in Bali, Indonesia. For those of you who will leave before the closing ceremony, I wish you have a pleasant and safe trip back home. Selamat jalan, we call that. Please join me to give a big hand to all the panelists and moderator. I return the floor to Mr. Marcus Kumar. Nothing to add. We resume at 2.30 for the open microphone taking stock session. <laughs>